Well, Merry Christmas, Arthur Christian Church. As here we are on Christmas Eve, 2017, and I tell you, it's been, it's been amazing just how fast this last year has gone by us already, and it's not over yet, but it's on the way. But uh, tonight, we're all here together to be able to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior, God, coming down to earth for us and being able to offer us the grace through Him. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and uh, then uh, Brother Bill's going to come forward and lead us in a song together, a hymnal together. So let's go to the Lord down in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for, for uh, God, just for Your love, the example of Your love. Over and over we see it in Scripture, and God, we just cannot praise You enough for the examples of that love we see, for Your grace. God, that is given so freely for each and every one of us. And God, we know according to your scripture, you tell us you want all to be saved. And God, we just thank you for that love and that promise that you give us in scripture that that is your wish. And God, that you make that grace so available and free for all of us. We just cannot praise you enough. We rejoice in the promises, God, that you give us in scripture. And God, as we come tonight in our Christmas Eve service, a time where we focus, God, on the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the form of a man. God, may we just be able to look upon the story tonight, the true and accurate biblical story, and see how it is just a further expression of your love for us, a love for mankind, and how you chose, God, to save humanity. God, be with us tonight. Would your Spirit be here with us? And God, if, if we have those burdens that came in here with us tonight, whether it be something going on with our family or whether it's a personal issue or jobs or sickness, whatever they are, God, in this time as we come in, God, would you remove anything that just has our heart in a bad place? And God, may we just focus on your love in this time we're here together. Would you restore us in our time together, God? And would you prepare our hearts to be able to worship you in song and in message tonight? God, be with us. God, just guide us in every way. Allow your spirit to be present, and may there be power in this message and in this time of togetherness tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Bill.
Tonight I'll be reading from Luke chapter 2, 16 through 22, and then I'll be going over to Luke 23, 44 through 46. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen, as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcisioning of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Years later, our Lord Jesus Christ came back to Jerusalem, first being praised and honored, and then being crucified. And on that cross, where he promised he would deliver our sins, Luke 23, 44 through 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. You see, we celebrate Jesus Christ as a baby boy coming into this earth and, and showing love. But he came ultimately to die so that we can have everlasting life. On that cross, he even was still witnessing to the thief on his side. And he said, tonight you will be in paradise. And I promise you, if you just believe and you have faith and you stay strong in the word and you continue to love our Lord and you continue to believe in the miracles that he has done and will do, then one night you will also be in paradise. And that is the greatest gift that we can ever give to a loved one, to a friend, to whoever they may follow in our midst. So as I light this Christ candle... May we celebrate tonight, not only the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we also celebrate the reason he came, was to teach, to serve, and to die, so that we too, one day, will be in paradise. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and heavenly Father, as we come into this place tonight, Father God, I ask that you allow us to feel your warmth. Allow our minds to be opened and our hearts to be ready for you. And Father God, if there's someone here tonight that does not know you, who has questions about you, may they come forward and receive paradise. For they may not have all the answers leaving tonight, but they can have grace which is given freely. Father God, be with Lenny tonight as he pours out his love to you and only to you by his voice. Father God, be with Pastor Carney as he delivers a message, a message that you helped him create. And may there be no hindrance in, in his message. May it just all be the for glory of you and may it be able to be understood by us. Father God, clear our minds. Let it, the Spirit come within us. Let us feel you, Lord. Let us go out into this world and truly be your hands and feet. For we say these things in your name. Amen. Yeah. Um, as we go into our message tonight, and Lenny has started that message off in song, 
Um, we're going to talk tonight about signs. And um, before I get into my message, I'm going to ask Melody if she would come forward. And uh, she has something she's going to read for you tonight. Um, I was looking for the globes to de decorate the fellowship hall. And it's been a few years since we've gotten these out. I found out that Chrismon means, or it stands for Christ and monogram. Um, and I remember the years that Uncle James Lewis would get his trees that he, he grew, the cedar trees, and he would pick one and it would be in the foyer and these white and gold ornaments would be on it. And I loved them, how they were nestled in the branches every year. Maybe some of you, it brings back memories to see it out again. And I think of the ladies of the church that have mentored me that helped make them a long time ago. And so I was taking out each one and gently looking at it because through the years they've kind of got a little bit crumbly or some of them are even broken. But I've nestled them in the tree again and I wanted to talk about them because it just made me think about them and think about the fragility of them. And so I looked up some of the history. I just, I had never known uh, where they came from. But I just knew it was something that brought back memories to me uh, for Christmas. And I found out that a lady named Miss Frances Spencer um, from the Lutheran Church, she decided in 1957 to make up some ornaments that would make the Christmas tree represent more to, about Christ. And when we first just look at the tree, I want you to think of the evergreen branches and think about eternity. And then think about how it points up to Christ and to heaven. And, of course, the white lights on it. You know, Jesus said that he was the light of the world, and in him is no darkness. And as we observe that and we think about how it all points, you know, nature, when we look at the trees, we see about how they point up to Jesus. And I think of a skyline where you just see all the trees pointing up. And in Romans 1.20 it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made, so that men are without excuse. We have no excuse when we look at Jesus' creation. And I know, and we know that the rocks will even cry out if we forget to praise him. But just as Lenny just praised him and said hallelujah, we're praising him in this church today, but I hope we will remember that the tree needs to point up to Jesus. So just take a minute to think about the white being the purity and the gold being the majesty. And then if you've never had a chance to look at the different ornaments, I want to take a minute just to explain some of them to you. But first start at the top where you see the crown. For Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then there's one on here that shows the Alpha and the Omega. We know that Jesus is the beginning and the end. And then I learned about one that I had not thought about before. Um, there's some that are like the shape of a cube, like this one right here. And it's because Jesus is the cornerstone. We know that. And it has some different um, Greek letters on there, like the Chi and the Rho, standing for Jesus Christ. There are ones that we'll recognize really quickly, the grapes and the wheat branches representing the, the cup and the, and the bread that we take every Sunday for communion. The shell represents baptism, and we know that Jesus was baptized and we are to be baptized. And even the shell was used as a pilgrimage item for the Israelites to drink out of sometimes when they would travel back to the Holy Land. So there's so many different things on there. The fish um, is up here to represent how Jesus' disciples were fishermen, and we think of the little boy and the fish and the loaves. We could think of it that way. And even as Christians became Christians and started being called Christians, the fish was a symbol because they were, didn't want to be found out, and they had to kind of hide, and that was one of their symbols for them when they were in their time of persecution. There are hands in prayer to remind us that praying is an important part of what a Christian does. Um, there are doves, butterflies. Uh, the doves are for peace. Um, and then we think of the dove coming down to, um, as Jesus was baptized, and the butterfly to show transformation that we go through as Christians being new in Christ. The heart, for God is love. Even a shamrock represents the Trinity. There are a lot of circles on here, um, and the circles represent eternity, and there are even some, a different shape called a tri trifecta, I think is the way you call it, and it stands for the Trinity also, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, all these symbols should point us back to Christ. The Jews were here tonight. They looked for a sign. Do we see the signs that are even in our church? And do we seek to understand more? God has signs for us all around. And so will you follow his road signs? Thank you, Melody, for starting us off. And, you know, Christmas is a time of surprise, a time of wonder, and a time of delight. 
And, um, you know, have, how many of you have gone to that new place for Christmas? Maybe it's a new piece of the family or you're, you're having to go somewhere else. You just find yourself traveling. Um, you know, and, and uh, today we don't look things up on a map. We just put it in our phone, you know, and it's to carry us around. We don't even buy GPS units anymore because our phone can do everything. And, um, but, you know, I do remember the days. I remember being trained by my parents of how to actually read a map and how you would plot a, a course if you needed to go far away, how you would have directions, you would write those down. But I became so reliant on my phone um, I'll give you an example that just a couple of weeks ago, I was on the way somewhere and I really needed to be there um, in kind of an emergency. And um, I was relying on my phone. I typed it in. I had about 32 miles to go and I was going in a place that I rarely had ever been before. And um, I was in Beaufort County and guess what happened to that cell phone? It lost signal. And I remember thinking, well, that's all right. I know how to read a map. And just behind my seat, I quickly pull over and I pull my map out and I say, well, what road am I on? And then I start looking. You know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a sign. And we stopped looking for signs. We're in such a rush and going in so many different ways that now we just kind of get somebody else to lead us. Or once we think we know our way, we don't pay signs that much notice anymore. And uh, I want to focus on looking for a sign tonight. You know, there's so many signs in Scripture. I, I read two this morning. I'm going to read again. A sign of God's love for us in the form of a Savior. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore in the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call His name Emmanuel. In Micah 5, 2 it says, But thou Bethlehem, Euphrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto uh, thee that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forths have been from old and from everlasting. You know, there's all kinds of signs in Scripture, and sometimes we just decide not to look at them, or people of old have decided not to look at the signs. I'm sure at the time in 1950-whatever, when we first did this tree in Arthur Christian Church, and that was a couple of years before me, that, you know, I, I bet they went through every single sign that they put on this tree, and that that was told and people understood the meaning behind it. But, you know, like many things in our life, if that doesn't pass around or if we miss the importance of a sign, it's really just nothing. It's just there. You know, behind me, uh, both on our communion table and on our wall behind me is a cross. And in the center of that cross are three letters. Do you know what those letters stand for? They're Latin for the Christ. Do we know that or do we just sit? Have you ever sat back and just wondered about those things? You know, if we don't look for the signs and look for the meanings in them, we, uh, we really means nothing to us and we miss what God is doing. I want to read, I'm going to start a little bit sooner than uh, Brad did and as he came in tonight, you know we never talk about what we're going to do other than an item. We never say, well you do this scripture and I'll do this scripture and tonight was one of those times Brad said, I'm going to be reading out of Luke 2 and I said, well I'm going to be reading out of Luke 2. And he says, well, I won't do it. And I said, no, God's laid it upon your heart for a reason. I want you to read it, and don't you worry about it. And uh, I said, I'll read it again. It's okay. But Brad started at a certain point that I'm going to stop at. That's just how God works it together. But I want to read to you from Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one of his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the, of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his wife, his espoused wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered." 
And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there went out in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I am bringing you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to, to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read your message tonight, God, I know that you have purpose in the words that have been chosen. And God, for many that came here tonight, this is a tradition. This is a place we come, or even for some of us, if we're honest, a place we're drug at Christmas Eve. It's a fun time. We enjoy it, God. But sometimes we don't really get the complete message. But God, I know you're going to do something tonight. I know your spirit has been working, and there's power in that. And God, I just ask that there be power in the words of your Bible spoken tonight. May your spirit work in, in ways that some have never felt. And God, would we just rejoice you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many times have we come and... Uh, you know, usually for us, it's going to be now be the first Sunday night of December is always going to be our play where we have the, the kids, and we do that so we don't compete against other churches. You know, it seems like everybody's got to see little Sally and this or that, and all the family comes to watch. But how many times have you watched that Christmas program, you know, the pageant? And we have our kids of Mary and Joseph, you know, and, and they're all decorated up, and mom's got to get the camera out and get the picture just right, you know, for when they're Mary and Joseph. And, and, and we look at baby Jesus, you know, which is usually a doll. And uh, then we have the shepherds that come, you know, and they got the hooks every now and then. They'll get in a fight with those hooks. But, you know, usually uh, we just never know what's going to happen. It's just fun watching the kids, isn't it? But, you know, they come forward, and, and then right after them, what comes next? Three kings come, right? The Magi. You know, and we look at that, and we've seen it so much, we just say, well, yeah, that's the Christmas message. No, that is not the Christmas message. Let's look in the details of what's going on. Can you imagine these shepherds that are out on a regular old night? They're pretty much not liked by the people. That's the job nobody wants. And they're outside, and, but they're totally happy. They love it. They love living on the land, looking up at the stars. And all of a sudden, an angel appears to them. Can you imagine what that would actually be like? And then from the message, it says, and the glory of the Lord is shown around. Can, can you just think of that for a second? Because this is not just in some ordinary, you know, Christmas. Uh, we look at a, a Christmas program going on. Can you imagine this night... And what that must have been like, as Luke tells us. You know, and he says, um, And it was so that Mary and Joseph, even before the angel went to them, they had to get up from where they were, and they had to travel all the way back to Bethlehem because of a tax. And everybody had to do that. Can you imagine what that was like? How many of you want to go to Greenville to Walmart tonight? Nobody, right? <laughs> So can you imagine if it was everybody now has to come to Bethlehem? And so everybody's coming in at the same time. This isn't just some quick story. This was real life happening for them. And can you imagine what it was like for all of them? But especially Mary and Joseph, who couldn't find a room. And then to have their babe. You know, we always do a really good job. Somebody made us about 15 years ago. This nice little barn background. You know, it's a cute little barn that has a nice roof on it. We'll throw a little bit of hay, and we've got this nice new manger that an animal has never eaten out of. 
that we lay baby Jesus in. But can you imagine what it would have been like for any of you ladies having your first child in a manger where all the animals are and they have to place them in a food trough because that's what it is. You see, sometimes the imagery we see doesn't quite carry us completely back. But beyond that, what I want you to see, the angel comes to the shepherds, verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The glory of God shone around them. And they were sore afraid. I imagine that we would be sore afraid as well. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Here this angel is, and the glory of God around, and he's telling these lowliest of people there were in society, a Savior is being born today. Can you imagine that excitement of them? They're like, how are we getting this news? And then something happens in verse 12. Have you ever read it this way? And this shall be a sign unto you. That ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This shall be a sign for you. Think about it. These guys which are used to staying out of town now have to go in town, into Bethlehem. And I guarantee you Jesus was not the only baby born that night. <laughs> All right? As we look at that, that's $50 to the mission fund on Christmas Eve. All right. So, here we are. These shepherds have to go into Bethlehem. How is it that they're going to find Christ? How is it they're going to find the babe, the Savior of the world? This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, which could be normal, but lying in a manger. You know, there was only one babe that night in Bethlehem that was wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Why would that importance be in Scripture for us. There must be importance to why it's in Scripture for us. You see, it's a sign that here, in so many ways, the king of the world was being born in the lowliest way. You know, the first thing we see in this is humility. God left, or Jesus left, sitting beside God in the Trinity of heaven, and coming to this earth as a servant for who? For us. You know, Philippians, Paul talks about this, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses, and it says this in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even of the death of the cross. You know, we celebrate Jesus' birth on Christmas Eve. You know, we're thinking of that Savior but Jesus' birth was probably like most births are. The real miracle happened nine months earlier when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and God Almighty sent His Spirit in the form of His Son to be born a man. So we see in the manger, first of all, humility. You know, why would God have done that? If you remember two years after this, we have King Herod that has heard all of the signs and the prophecy. And he wants to be able to find this Messiah and have him killed. In fact, he orders because he doesn't know where to find the babe, all babes from the age of two and under, to be killed, to be murdered. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it was like in that time? 
But here we have Jesus born in a manger. To be sure, that couldn't be the Son of God. Humility. The second thing, when we, we go back and we look at this verse in Luke, it says that you shall find this babe in swaddling clothes. You know, the best way of describing that, it's not the beautiful thing we do up here when we place a nice little purple sheet, you know, uh, around the babe. Swaddling means that they really tied the arms and the legs one by one, and then they bound them together, almost like a mummy. All right, and it went across the head too, so you could get to the head here. But the whole reason was the safety of the babe. You know, you didn't want the baby moving all around because a lot of kids didn't make it past a year old. And so there was safety in the swaddling of clothes. But I want you to think about that. What does that do to, to a child? It constricts them, right? It makes it where they can't move. Isn't it amazing how Jesus came into this world in humility and the first thing that was done is he was cleaned and swaddled in clothes, restricting his movement. And then we see just before he goes out of this world as a man, that his hands are restricted as he is standing falsely accused before Pilate, and then takes the cross for my sins and your sins. We see here the love of God come again. He says, this is a sign, and this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped. Again, the babe is just the, the Greek, when we look at that, it just means a baby. Nothing special. It's just a child being born as normal children. You know, have you ever seen that word that says, this shall be a sign unto you? Here were the shepherds needing a way to be able to find the Messiah. And there was only one babe born that night in swaddling clothes and having to lay with animals in the manger. It was a sign unto them that the Savior has been born and that they were at the right place. It's a sign to us of God's love for us and even in that love, He didn't send this conquering Savior as most people were expecting. Although that's exactly what Christ was, was a conqueror. He tells His brothers and sisters in Christ, Fear not, for I have overcome the world. That's the Messiah we look at today. You know, I want to go back in one other scripture I started to read this morning. And it's John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to a man named Nicodemus. He's a ruler. And he sees some truth in Jesus, but he's scared to really reach out there because he knows that if he is seen with Jesus as a follower of Jesus, he's probably going to be put to death himself. And so he comes to Jesus at night, and he asks Jesus questions back and forth. And, you know, Jesus is telling him, hey, if you want to be saved, if you want to receive salvation, you must be born again. He says, how can a man be born again? You know, can he enter twice into his mother's womb? And Jesus goes on to say, no, you've got to be born of spirit and of truth. And he gets to this point, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify what we've seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that come down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know, he's talking here. He says, if I'm telling you about earthly things that you see every day and you don't believe the truth, he says, there's no way you're going to believe the heavenly things, the spiritual things that we see spoken of in God's Word. And then he gives an example that goes all the way back to the Exodus, and it's recorded in Numbers. And just for time's sake, I'll tell you that Moses is leading Israel away from Egypt. 
They're on their exodus. And the people are a bunch of whiners and complainers. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot like our world in America today, probably. You know, but they just don't like anything. And they're like, you took us out of slavery and out of bondage, but we're about to starve, you know, and we don't like this manna that's coming, you know, and they're just complaining. So God, this is like the third or fourth time they're complaining. So God sent fiery serpents on the land that were biting at their heels. And they were poisonous, and the people started dying. And they came to Moses, and they said, what have we done? We need to repent. You know, they're asking God to forgive them. And Moses goes to God, and God tells Moses to make the image of that fiery serpent and to put it on a stake. And the people have to look up to that. And who will look up to that shall be healed. Jesus is saying this because that was, again, another sign that's going to take place one day. <laughs> that the only way we're going to be saved and have everlasting life is to look up at our Savior who is on a tree. And that's why he says this next verse in verse 15, that he says in verse 14, and, Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You know, so many times people get a thought process that church and religion is full of hypocrites, hypocrites and condemning people. And I would say that's, that's probably right. It's got some of that in it. But that's not who God is. That's who imperfect people can be. And God does not give us religion to condemn us. He gives us a message of salvation to save us. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Sure, there's condemnation that's in Scripture, but that is of people who will refuse to place their hope and their trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, religion, Christianity is about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Notice what this verse says again. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And he that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And it says this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Christmas is about a time that we celebrate another step of God's love to mankind. God said, I made you and I made you with a purpose. And that purpose is in to be in a relationship with me. But I know you're imperfect. Sin has entered the world and it's going to cloud what you see and what you do. But I've made a way to remove that. I've made a way for your sins to be taken away from you and given to Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate. Jesus' birth, being born as a man, coming to this earth, living God, coming to earth, being born and living, teaching us how to live, and ultimately taking the cross for our sins. That's the love of God. And that's what we celebrate the beginning of as we come to Christmas Eve. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You know, in Scripture, Jesus is called the light. And um, it says that this is the condemnation because men love darkness rather than light. Some of you sitting in here right now if I may just talk about the elephant in the room. Some of you sitting in here right now do not have a love relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He did not come to condemn you. He came to save you. And you can leave here tonight knowing that salvation has come to you 
and from you to your household and to many others. That's the hope that we have as we come tonight in a Christmas Eve message. You know, what we're going to do next is I'm going to ask Brad and Lenny to come forward, and we're going to take communion together. And, and um, we do this every Christmas Eve. We're going to take communion together, but I want us to fully understand what that communion is about. Jesus, before going to the cross, told His disciples the night before He was taken that, hey, here are two items that are common to you. Here's bread and here's a cup. And I want you to understand that every time you take of this bread, to do it in remembrance, remembrance of Him, that that bread represents the love sacrifice that Jesus was about to make for them. They didn't fully understand it then. But after they saw it happen, they did. And we get to see all of it in Scripture play out. And so taking communion is an understanding that we remember as we take the bread, Jesus' body being crucified on the cross. And as we take the cup, we're remembering His blood, His saving blood being spilled on the cross that our sins could be forgiven and we can have salvation in eternal life. What a wonderful gift God has given us. So we're going to take communion together, and then afterwards we're going to sing. I can't remember what it is. I'll tell Kathy in a minute. And we're going to light our candles in representation of Jesus as the light. He's the light that's come in the world. But some of you the Spirit is speaking to right now. And I don't want you to come forward in front of everybody else, but when this service is over tonight, don't run out that door. Would you listen to the Spirit? Would you do the best thing that could ever possibly happen in your life? And would you just meet me right over here and let me tell you about the Savior? I know God's speaking to you tonight. I ask you to think about that as we take communion together. We're going to do it um, sim similar to intention. We're going to have you come forward by rows and uh, take a piece of the bread and take a cup. We do have a disposal basket for your cups as you're going back. But each row, as you see the row in front, come with the next row come after. I'm going to pray for the bread. Brad's going to pray for the cup. And then we're going to have our first rows come together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for your message. And God, I know this message is by you because what I prepared cut off and I couldn't turn it back on. But God, you spoke through me the words you wanted spoken tonight. And God, I, I just thank you for that. I thank you for being able to be used in this church, in this congregation, and exactly for the people that are here tonight or listening abroad. And God, as we go around this table, as you have prepared our hearts in message through song and prayer, and as we come around this table, may we really understand what communion is about. And God, I ask your blessing upon this bread. May we understand that it represents Christ's body on the cross for our lives to be saved. Father God, as we... Begin this communion. This is more than just a tradition, Father God. It is a sign from you. A sign for us to take this cup that represents your Son, Jesus Christ, who bled on that cross so that we can have everlasting life. And Father God, as we take this cup, we are believing in you. We are giving our faith to you. We're giving our love to you. And we're accepting the grace that is freely given by your Son. So, Father God, as we take this cup, we take it in honor of you, in remembrance of you, and the, the belief that you truly gave your Son for us so that we can have that paradise one day in heaven. stand and sing together.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again and we just thank you, God, for your love. We thank you for your grace. And God, I thank you for the power that you give through your Holy Spirit in that spirit being present with us tonight. God, may what we have done here tonight bring you honor and glory and be pleasing to you in every way. And God, as these families go out of this church building tonight, over the next days and, and times of Christmas gatherings and family coming around and those that go back to work and whatever may be, God, just as this tree points to you, may we through our actions and our witness and our life shine like lights in this dark world. And may others just be inquisitive to why it is that we are able to live the way we live and give us that opportunity to just share your gospel. And God, for those that I know, God, that you are dealing with tonight, God, may they have the boldness to not worry about anything else but just understand that they really don't have the relationship with you that they need. And God, even if they don't understand it all, but that draw is there to seek you out, God, would they have enough boldness to come, Lord, at the end of this service, over to the side, away from everyone, and accept your loving grace into their life. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for Jesus Christ as we celebrate his birth. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. Elders, if I could. If